welcome back to the wildlands and tonight we're going to have a look at the harsh realities of living off grid as with many things social media paints a romantic image of the freedom of living out in the country growing your own food becoming self-sufficient and so on tonight we're going to have a look at the actual realities from our perspective so we've been here now off grid for nearly three years and in the past year five or so of our friends have moved away from this lifestyle for various reasons. Um, so we're gonna have a look at some of those reasons from our perspective and the actual realities of how difficult it can be at times living an off-grid lifestyle for us here in central Portugal, but wherever you may choose to be doing that, be that America, Australia, and so on. Yeah, and we're gonna look at what kind of things might prompt us or tempt us to eventually leave the off-grid lifestyle. So one of the most important things being off grid is generally the availability of water, be that for washing and drinking and cooking or for watering your plants and your garden. So for us, we bought a property in rural Portugal, in central Portugal, which had its own water supply in the form of a well, which is all the way down there at the bottom of our land. And for those of you that are new to our channel, we've got just under 1.5 hectares, so about three acres and our well is three acres away at the very bottom of the land and when we bought the land the well had water in it and then we found out the reality wasn't it when we got into our first summer what happened the well ran dry in the yeah. height of summer because it was hot and we'd been pulling water out and all of our neighbors that use are on the same water table us had been pulling water out as well so it just ran low and then our plants died so that's one of the biggest realities is the fact that not only might you run out of water and you're not connected to the mains and have this magical supply all year round but if you start running out of water then that means going forward either you have to move or you have to put in practice the infrastructure of water management either to pump water into storage vessels be that ponds reservoirs water bladders concrete water containers and so on so for us that was a big challenge and even now in our third year we're still dealing each year with the challenge of water management and improving the availability of water because we really as the garden gets bigger and obviously water is extremely important to have available all year round if you're trying to be self-sufficient and growing your own food or just if you're growing trees and so on you need water I think you've started with water there, but obviously if you're off grid, then it's the things that you can't get from the grid anymore. So water is one of them. Yeah. You don't get it pumped. Of course. Um, you don't get your waste taken away. Your, um, you don't necessarily have a garbage truck pulling up at your curb, although some people might. Um, you don't have your sewage taken away and electricity is the other yeah. obvious one, uh, and gas, I suppose. You don't have a, a gas line to your property, so then you have to come up with ways to deal with those. So although you can pop in solar, that's great. It's free energy. You obviously have the initial setup costs, um, and then you have to maintain that. And then you've probably done your setup based on the electricity that you need, but then a couple of years go by and you go, do you know what? I want to have a washing machine and a dishwasher. So then you need more solar, so you need more panels and more batteries and so on. So there's this, um, and then upkeep, of course. So that's something to consider and maybe when you start out and you have you put these systems in place and they'll make do after a while you start hankering for what you might have had in a house i know that i've had that with um the idea of having a shower building or room with a hot running shower so you can just you know in a house you turn on the tap and you have hot water as much as you like and yeah you have to pay for it but that wasn't one of our priorities when we moved on the land so we have an outdoor shower and we have a shower in our van which is very small but you know it's things like that things yeah, when you first gets... move off grid you have one set of what's important to you and then time goes by and you realize actually i wish i'd done it a little bit differently when yeah. i started gets very tiring very quickly not having a proper bathroom doesn't it yeah and having to heat up water in pans on the stove and so on and then as well as that, those factors of what actually makes up technically living off grid, you've got all the other bits. So you've got if the land you buy doesn't have a building on it that you can't live in, then you've got to live in something. So that might be you stay in your camper van if you have a camper van or motorhome. Or if we look at some of the people that have left local to us, a couple of them were living in a bell tent. Seems idyllic and very romantic. You know, or you've got yurts your, as or well. Yurts. You've got Similar your thing. yurt, your bell tent, you've got a beautiful view. And then the reality is in the winter, it's freezing cold, it's difficult to heat, it's damp, it can get moldy. Yeah. And then in the summer, it's completely the opposite. It's 40 degrees every day, sometimes even hotter in centigrade, 45, 46 centigrade, it's roasting hot. There's no ventilation and that gets all 
very tired very quickly, yeah. doesn't it? And again, it is romantic. You move onto your land and you go into your bell tent and they're beautiful and they're, you know, you can glamp in them in, in everyday life. So it sounds like a great idea. And then I think it is that thing, it takes its toll. Yeah. however many years that might be for you or if you have kids a lot of people come out here and start having babies and then you're suddenly you're in a tent with a baby which can yep. maybe push your boundaries a little bit so so can we survive off grid so many of our fr friends have have found it tough for some of the reasons that we've mentioned generally speaking when you go off grid you have a blank canvas so all the things that you need you have to put in so a that's financially quite difficult sometimes because some of those things can be quite expensive although you can do them on the cheap to use a phrase um, but they're all parts of the infrastructure that make your life more comfortable, aren't they? And it is nice because you might be thinking at this point, already shouting at your tellies, well, why don't you just buy land that has the infrastructure that you need? It doesn't even have to be on the grid, but you know, it's got, and I think part of the joy of this life, although it's really flipping hard, is the doing it yourself. We, when we build our bathroom, it can be exactly what we want. It can yep. look how we want. It can be made out of, of um, you know, maybe it's recycled materials and that's your thing. And you want to be as eco-friendly and regenerative as possible. Or maybe you want to have something really swanky with tiles and glass and night. And you can, you can do that yep. if you can afford it and yep. you can get the permissions if you need them, then you can build it however you want, wherever you want on your land, which is great. I love yep. that idea. Yeah, one of our friends built a lovely bathroom which had a flushing toilet, had a bath in it, had a shower. The shower and the bath were powered by an off-grid style boiler which basically ran off propane or butane gas that you buy in a bottle that you'd use for your oven. And so not really everybody will know, but here you can just go to the shops and get a gas bottle and bring it yeah, home and then swap them, yeah. it out yeah. for a refilled one. Because I don't think they do that so much in England. No, not in England. No. Don't know about America. Probably the same as England, I think. So they have all of that and they put that in for virtually nothing. So they built the walls out of pallets and the roof was out of secondhand clay tiles that they got off a local farmer and so on. So you can do things, as I said earlier, on the cheap, but you've got to have, maybe have the skills to do it or you've got to stick your toe in and dive in and build things that you've never built before, be that plumbing or buildings. I mean, we're building a cabin for Rosie that you'll have seen in many of our cabin videos. Neither of us have built a building or a cabin before. That is, going back to what you said, part of the joy, isn't it? Is it's finding those challenges and overcoming them and realizing actually, when you put your mind to it, you can build a house. You can, yeah, yeah, it's magic. Of course, doing buildings like that on your own uh, can come with its own set of problems and drawbacks which is that when you want to build something and you think you know what you're doing and you think you've planned for all the eventualities and then you live with it for a certain period of time, whether it takes months or years, then you realize that actually you wish you'd done it differently because then there are things that you didn't know. So for example, when we put our chicken uh, coop in, the coop is fantastic and great. The outside secure run is great. But when we put the secure pen on, we didn't think it needed a roof. It's like they'll be out happy outside, it'll be breezy, they'll get sunshine, they like that. And actually it turns out would have been much better off with a roof because in the winter, the rain makes their floor into a mud bath and in the summer it's too hot and sunny there for them. So they don't they don't go in there anyway. So we've got to put a roof on so it this year. So we've got to put a roof on, yeah. yeah. And then when we moved on our land and we had no structure with a roof, the first thing, because we bought our land in July, so it was exceedingly hot. So the first thing we did was what we call our shade house, which was basically four stilts with a roof designed to give us some shade from the sun and some protection from the rain. It was kind of meant maybe not to be a temporary structure, but we didn't really think through, we were just like, we've got to have some shade. Yes. So now we've got our shade house and we keep adding to it. So we put a wall up, we put some storage space in, we put an outdoor kitchen on the front initially without a roof and then it rained a lot and it got wet. So we put a roof on it and we keep improving it. So I think eventually what we will do is we'll either take the shade house structure down and put a proper building up that has four walls, front doors, windows, and a full roof so that we can sit in the dry in the winter and in the summer it's enclosed so perhaps we can keep some of the heat out. Also, we have an outdoor um, log burner which works very well, but it's not very efficient in the sense that it's burning its heat outside. So we're losing a lot of the heat. Whereas if we had an enclosed building, we'd, we'd need less logs. 
and logs take a lot of time because you have to go around with a chainsaw and collect your own logs and saw them up and drag them up the land. We have to chop wood every day when we need a fire, which takes about an hour of our day. And, and again, so I bet people are shouting at the tellies and their screens saying, "That's why didn't you just think to do that in the first place? Why would you build a little temporary tiny structure that doesn't do the job you need, but we didn't know what job we needed it to do? And we thought that that would just keep us covered, as you said, just right immediately keep the sun off and then keep the rain off and then we were thinking maybe we would do our cabin next and then it turned out we did the food forest and then we did that again and the chickens and the this and we've done all these other things in two and a half years and we still don't have a cabin no. so now with hindsight you can say ah yes it would have been more sensible to make that into a weenie cabin when yep. we started but and the toilet and bathroom we've been saying every month for about three years yeah. we'll get that started next week yeah. uh, we did actually start it um, and then got so far and decided when we went to get permission for the building, it was too big. So then we stopped that and we went on to Rose's cabin. And now we've got some of the wood and we have some of the bathroom fittings so we could actually get our toilet built almost straight away. But there's always things to do, isn't there? So we have a list of jobs. This is one of the really, a lot of people off grid all say the same thing. You've got a massive list of jobs and you think as I check them off, the list will get smaller and then I'll come to a point where I have no jobs left. <laughs> what actually happens is you keep crossing things off and you get another four things on the list. You yeah. cross one off, five go on. So this list is just and never ending. And you have to keep prioritizing. So like you say, the toilet and shower build, Although it is important, it's not as important or as time sensitive as, say, building a chicken coop because you've got a chicken coming next week and you don't have a coop for them. Or um, I have to get my seeds in now because if I don't start them now, all my vegetables will be growing too late in the season. Yeah. They might get hit by the summer heat. So then, you know, I'll bump that up and things keep getting bumped above and then you don't get round to everything. So I think all of these things add up, don't they? They do. And I think they could be exhausting for somebody that thought, that they were just gonna buy some land and they'll put in their infrastructure and it'll be quick and easy, you know? They, they may think it'll take a year or two years and they'll tick off all the lists, all the items that they want on their land and that'll be job done. And if two years later or four or six years later, you still haven't done those things and maybe, you know, the chopping of logs, for example, that gets tedious, doesn't it? it? Does, yeah, They're having day. to go to the laundrette because you don't have the plumbing or the infrastructure to put in washing machine. It, it does, it gets tedious and wearing, and I can see how it might just be tempting to go, do you know what, if we sold our land, we'd get X amount of money, we could spend that on a house, has a washing machine. Yeah. Then you turn on a switch and your lights come on, and you turn on a tap and you have hot water, that does, does sound tempting, to it be does. honest. Yeah, yeah. So if we look at the people that have come and then gone, some were here longer than us, some arrived after us and have already left, and I think it's four one or more of those many reasons. The other thing is that even if you're trying to live off grid on a humble budget and try and manage money, it doesn't go very far because a lot of things, even pallets here are four or five euros a pallet to buy. Can't get them free because everybody off grid wants pallets. So therefore they've become a resource that has a value. All wood and all building materials are very expensive. Yeah. So even if you want to build something very basic, it costs a lot of money. So even a very small basic wood cabin would probably cost you 10,000 euros. So it's a lot of money. So then you add on all the other things that you might want, toilets, showers, boilers, yeah. you know, make yourself a living area, family room, whatever you want to call it, or build a whole house. It all suddenly becomes a lot of money. So you have to make sure that you have a steady, decent income, which you have to have anyway, before you are allowed to get, you know, visas to come and live here and apply for residency and so on. But it's, it's important. And if you lose your source of income for any reason, you get laid off or you're fired or you decide to change um, professions or what have you, then it's not easy to get work, is it? No. Because everybody's looking for work and I'm sure it's the same all over the world at the moment in this current climate. One of the things is everyone's looking for the same sort of work. So you've got all different things, but you've got people that are, I'll, I'll do laboring or gardening or, or I'll build things. So here in Portugal, if you wanted to be a builder, say, you've got to be an approved builder. If you want to do work on people's houses that have a habitation license so then you've got to be able to speak Portuguese perhaps and so on but then everyone wants to be a builder who's of a labour type mentality then you've got all the people that go I know I'll make soaps for a living or I'll sell honey from the bees I keep or I'll grow plants and I'll sell them yeah, that's everybody's true. trying to do the same sorts that's of things that's true and you might not get that effect if you chose to live slightly more remotely than we have because for us in the centre of Portugal 
there are a lot of people doing it. I'm sure you know already, you've seen on YouTube that there are lots and lots of people doing what we're doing, making YouTube videos about it. So we're all doing similar things, trying to live ecologically. And as you say, you got bees. Bees are a nice, fairly easy thing to have coming in. You want to make money from it, or you put a caravan or a tent on your land and you want to attract people to come and stay in it. And that'll bring in like Airbnb kind of money. And yeah, it is just the sheer amount of people doing a very, very similar thing in, in a small area that reduces the income to yeah. go around. Yeah. So regardless of whether you work for yourself as we do, or if you have a job or some kind of work that you do away from your land, that has an implication, doesn't it? Yes, of course, yeah. The time spent doing work, if you're having to work long hours each day, then, um, then that's less time that you have to spend on your land. So if you have to go out to work and you're working for most of the day, then you don't have enough time to spend maybe growing your own food so that you, have, you can be self-sufficient in your vegetables and so on, or to make your buildings or to set yourself up off grid. And then it's either going to take a really long time, sort of maybe 10, 20, 30 years, like you were saying, or you just will get disheartened because you just can't get anything done. And yeah. then it would be easier to live in a house because then at least you have the comfort at the end yeah. of the day when you come home from work. Yeah, it's a constant juggle. A good analogy would be if you just look at myself or at Missy. So in my case, I do almost all the editing for YouTube. It takes me generally two, two and a half days a week to run a channel that probably gives me 20 quid a month, 30 quid a month. Yeah, it's not lucrative. So that's two and a half days that I could be spending doing something else that is productive for the land. I could be building on those two and a half days or gardening or what have you. I can't not do that and I have tried to do less. So that's why the wild land is off grid particularly. We've been very sporadic. We've had videos out once a fortnight, once every three weeks, even once a month because I've been prioritizing other things then my channel or our channel then suffers, the viewership is down because we're not regular. So then you've got this seesaw and then you obviously work and work in the events business. So if you spend three days a week doing that, say hypothetically, then that's three days you haven't got to build or grow, grow food, food or whatever. Yeah, or enjoy uh, my life. Or enjoy your life, yeah. <laughs> so generally speaking, it's the same sort of thing um, for everyone. If you go and look at, at the financial side, we know several friends who came to Portugal with what they considered and is re in reality quite a considerable sum of money. And you think that's great, I can buy my land, I can set it up, I'll have enough money for my infrastructure, I'll put all that in, and then you run out of money. Or you run out of that lump sum that you needed to buy wood and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, well we did. We did, yeah. We did the yep. same, we came yep. with a lump sum and you think it's gonna be enough and then you just sort of underestimate what have you. And then you have to make your, whatever your job is, stretch that. Yep. Because it's not only just providing what you're used to providing, it's not just doing your food and your bills, but then it's also having to go extra to make the infrastructure. It is, yeah. So, so I mean, hopefully at some point you'll have all your buildings done or whatnot, and then and then you can just live comfortably. So you just have to get used to living hardships yeah. for a little so while. So I think you'd have to look back and say, oh, I've been off grid for 30 years and I've built my cabin for my children, I've built a cabin for myself, my pets are taken care of, my chickens have a safe coop and living environment, I've got a bathroom with hot running water, I've got a toilet facility, be that compost or using other methods of off-grid type. Of, uh... So that's not really any different to the people that are content to keep living in a house and then they plan to enjoy themselves and their life once they're retired. Yeah. Because you're set, you know, if, if, if it's going to take 30 years to get everything together, then all you have left is your little bit of retirement at the end, isn't it? Yeah. So you might as well have lived in a house. But, <laughs> well, yeah, but it's different, isn't it? <laughs> but it is different because it's not the same as living in a house. It feels um, a lot freer and you're in close contact with nature if you're living off grid the way that we do. There's yeah. a lot of benefits to this to, to do in the meantime. It's just, it's similar to house life in that it's, it's hard going, just in a different way. Yeah. And I think it's arguably perhaps more healthy because we're outside for 12 to 14 hours a day, which has got to be good for your health. Yeah. But then you've got the downside of that is in the summer, like we said earlier, it's excessively hot. In the winter, it's very chilly, windy, raining, so on, and you're outside and you've got no... And it's, it's easy, isn't it, to say, we'll put all the infrastructure in. And again, we were talking about this with other friends just last night. And it's, it's, a, it's all those factors, isn't it? It's money, time. So can we survive off-grid? Probably. Probably. And I've noticed. <laughs> Will we stick it out? 
maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I've noticed of late that you've made quite a few hinting comments where in the past you'd have said, oh, I love my land, I never want to leave, it's amazing. Whereas now you've been going, oh, yeah, what at the wall, you know, that you can buy quite a nice house with a large garden for the same sort of money that perhaps we would get if we sold the wildlands. No, I'm not looking to move to a house anytime soon. I'm still enjoying this. It's, uh, I don't know, I just wish that you could press a magic button and have your infrastructure, as we keep saying, pop, there it is, ta-da, it's ready, and then you can spend your days gardening in peace and happiness and just be like pottering about on your land instead yeah. of doing the hard slog that it actually is, because you're fitting in, we do work normal jobs as it were, we don't go out to Tesco's and work on a checkout for nine hours, but we work the equivalent, is what I mean, yeah. of a normal job, and we're doing all the housework and stuff that you would do in a normal life. And we're building cabins and taking care of chickens and trying to start a market garden and trying to run online social social media lives that's for the YouTube business and so on. So actually we're trying to do about yeah. six different things each. We're and spread too thing really. That's that thing, that's yeah, it really. But and we then... can't choose to spread ourselves any less thinly because we have to keep all of these no. and things then that, going. That's why then the infrastructure takes what seems like such a long period of time. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter what job you look at. If we look at, we've been trying to build the cats a catio for yeah. about a year yeah. or maybe longer longer and we've got to the point where we go right this is the date we're going to build the catio so that came and then it was really raining heavily so we couldn't work outside and and put the catio in while it was raining the next thing was while we were building the cabin we realized that we'd miscalculated slightly and we needed some extra battens so we used the battens that we'd already bought and stored for the yeah. catio and then so we then... had no money to replace them yeah and then the next time it was on the list i had a bad back That's so it's like right. we can't make massive um like uh put the big poles up That's and right, do all the digging yeah. and yeah. yeah. Um, and then we've been trying to put the floor in on the cabin and that's that's been moving. And again, it's mo always moved for good reasons. So we've been doing lots of gardening, getting ready for spring where we grow a lot of our own food. We've been growing a lot of extra plants and propagating a lot of stuff because we want to sell plants at markets. So that's taken a, a front seat. And then you're in this, you know, we're repeating ourselves in the cycle of what our life is like, isn't it? Yeah, but on a day like this, the sun's shining and the birds are singing and it's all lovely and you know you feel like you could live like this forever yeah and that's the upside isn't it you can get up in the morning and you're not going off to your nine to five whatever that may be even though we have all that work which is perhaps in some ways harder than a nine to five but you can get up in the morning and go what shall i do today yes. you can look at the weather it's sunny i'll go and do gardening and i've got some work to do on my business but i'll do that at three o'clock so now i'm going to do gardening or you can go a big oh, part of that is being self-employed yeah. which is so you've got flexibility a lot easier i mean obviously yeah. you could be self-employed anywhere but it's a lot easier if you're living out like this making your own hours up so you can garden in the morning and work in the afternoon and whatever you need to do so I'd highly recommend off-grid living. However, it's not for the faint of heart. It mm -hmm. does come with caveats of pain and financial stress and being I, knackered and... Yeah, I think, I think probably there is also um, an equation in there to do with m money versus time spent. So if you have lots of money, then you can get other people in to do your buildings course, yeah. and, and so on. And then you have less stress and um, hardship and so on but then maybe not the fun. So if you, and, yeah. and then if you have little money, then you can still have a lovely time off grid and make all your buildings and so on. You're just gonna have to put in extra hard work and do a lot of lugging of things and yep. axing down trees and chopping up your timber and stuff. <laughs> and another common thing that a lot of people off grid do, uh, and it helps with the financial side of things is they get woofers in oh, yeah. to do a lot of the labor or the work for them or with them. Um, and then you have to have the infrastructure in place initially to perhaps get the woofers in. So you might need, you, well, you would need, you'd need a toilet, you need the shower, and you need some form of accommodation at the bare minimum. That would be a tent or a yurt or a, a bell tent. But a woofer or, or is a, a person that works away. Yeah. So they leave home and they come to your land and they work for you in exchange, usually just for accommodation and food. Yeah. And we were talking about that again last night with our friends. And sometimes you get uh, woofers who have no skills so whilst they're a body that can help with moving lifting digging and what have you they're there to learn from you as well so there is a trade but that does come with its own problems sometimes you maybe have people who you think can provide you some kind of skill or benefit and then actually they don't do things to the same standard you would want it doing so so for us we decided although we we tend to talk about how much we have to do and how 
little time we have to do it. We don't want woofers, do we? We don't want other people coming in and doing stuff for us or no. to a different sort of standard to our, our We run own. all the pain for ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if we look at people local to us and the people that we've said that have left over the last year or so, probably around about half the people maybe a little bit less, but something along those lines have come, have started setting up or have indeed set up and then have decided for whatever reason that it's not for them. It's too hard, too hot, too cold, too expensive, whatever it may be. Um, but there, obviously that is an indicator that it's not as easy as you would think. And it is a hard way of living sometimes, even though it has wonderful benefits as well. Yeah. And it is easy to think the grass is always greener on the other side. Of course, if you go to a house, you've got the benefit of running water and electricity on tap, but then you have water rates, electric bills, rent mortgages, and all kind of council tax and all those kind of things, and suddenly giving you another financial burden. Yeah. So will we make it off grid for the duration? Come back in five years and we'll tell you. Yeah, that's probably the only way. Yeah. You, can't, you can't guess it, can you? No. Because I think at the moment, we're still happy enough toughing it out, but it's only been two and a half years. Yep. So we've got another brutal summer coming, I should imagine. Yep. And then the year after and the year after, and I don't know, maybe we'll reach the tipping point. But may maybe the tipping point won't be towards a house for us. Maybe it'll be back. Maybe we will get, we'll have the bathroom and, and toilet in and we'll have a cabin each. And then life will just get that little bit easier, which will tempt us to stay in here. Yep. Yeah, I think a big mountain and a hurdle for us is to finish Rose's cabin. That'd be very satisfying. Yes. And Rose would be very pleased. She's so excited about moving in. We're so close and yet we're so skint. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. we, have, we need to plaster it. We have no money to plaster it currently. Uh, we have a lot of stuff that we can do. So we're going to be getting on with that shortly. So we all have another cabin video we're putting in the floor in the next week. That's on the list, but yes. we've been putting that on. And for once while. the floor is in, we can also fit the diesel heater. And not that we need it in the summer, but it's a job ticked off. Yeah. <laughs> However, last April it got cold all of a sudden. Didn't That's it? true. Yeah. And it was minus five. So we might might have a use for a diesel heater yeah so come back in five years and we'll let you know how we're doing and yeah. we'll tell you what our in whether will we have a bathroom and a shower subscribe in so you don't miss out <laughs> on the epilogue on this <laughs> yeah so um i guess we should sign off i look forward to seeing the comments so leave us a comment with your thoughts i think a lot of people that follow us also live off grid so maybe we've missed something that you think is a hardship or makes it much easier and much more likely that you're going to stay off grid yep and if you live in a house, what do you think? Are we talking rubbish? And would you live off grid? Are you hoping to go off grid still? Have we just spoiled it all for you? <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for watching. And we'll see you again soon. Bye.